Hey, we're Phil and Meredith, and we're the pastors here at Cornerstone Church. We're excited to be coming to you through this platform today. We hope that your heart is encouraged, that your faith is stirred by what God speaks to you today. God bless you. Enjoy the message. My name is Phil. If we haven't met yet, and uh, I get the opportunity to bring the word here today, and I'm going to do so by stepping us into a familiar scripture for many of us that is the story of the Good Samaritan. This is found in Luke chapter 10. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you're welcome to go ahead and open them to Luke chapter 10. And we're gonna be reading about the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a story that many of us are familiar with if you've grown up in church. And even if you didn't grow up in church, this story is so famous that it really is ubiquitous throughout society that we know the idea of who a Good Samaritan is because of the prevalence of this story throughout society. And so we're gonna read this in Luke chapter 10. It reads like this in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? The lawyer answered, Lord, I love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who do you say that my neighbor is? In reply, Jesus answered, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Pay attention to the direction that they were going. They were going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's significant, and we're gonna get to that in a moment. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down that same direction on the same road when he saw the man and he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, or about a day's wages, and then he gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. And Jesus continued, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. God, we thank you for this parable. We thank you for this story. We ultimately thank you for the life that you have given us and for the life that you have called us into. You're a good God. And today we have tasted and seen that you are good. We love your presence. We love you ultimately, God. And God, you and I know that we have been working on this message for some time now that we're excited about it. But God, I know that there are people here that don't need to hear from Phil. They ultimately need to hear from you. And they need to hear a word that has been uniquely prepared specifically for them today. And so I ask for that to be made whole. I ask for the soil to be bearing great fruit as a result of the seeds that are planted today. And because you're a good God, we know that you'll do it. In the name of Jesus, we've all prayed together and said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jackie. So I've decided to title this message TikTok. TikTok, not like the social media platform TikTok that we all have or that the youth have where we're sharing these short engaging videos on that's gonna be like the MySpace in a couple of years when no one's using it anymore. But TikTok, like um, the clock is ticking. Do you know what time it is? TikTok. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and tell them TikTok. TikTok, TikTok. I remember a few years ago, my wife and I were invited to a birthday party for a friend of mine, and it came by way of a Facebook event, a private Facebook event, which is just already a lame way to invite people to a birthday party. I remember growing up, and I, like growing up in the days where you had an actual invitation that you were given for a birthday party, I don't know if I'm aging myself or not, but you were given like a piece of paper or cardboard that said all the information that was on it, it was either mailed to you or it was given to you in person. 
But this was a Facebook event, a private Facebook event that was created for my wife and I, and it said the information on it, and it said, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday this Saturday, 12-2, we'd love to see you there, and it had the information, and it had some other information down the bottom, but I thought, I already have as enough information, and I don't need to take any more in, so I put it on my calendar, and I told Meredith about it, and so on that Saturday, we decided to make our way up to the birthday party. We had sitters organized, and the trip was up at my friend's parents' house, like an hour up into Michigan. And so we arrived there after this long drive. We're like 10 or 15 minutes late, which is appropriate for a birthday party and totally acceptable. But we get there, and there's like no one in the driveway, maybe like one or two cars. We think, this is kind of weird. Maybe we have the address wrong. We pull the address back up, and it says, no, this is the right address. We're in the right place. And so we walk up to the house and we ring the doorbell and no one comes. We ring the doorbell again and still no one comes. And we start knocking on the door a little bit louder and still no one's coming. We think, this is strange. We've got the right address. It's definitely this Saturday. That's what the Facebook event said. And then we think maybe the party is around the back of the house. Maybe we should go around the back. Maybe it's a party that's on the deck or a patio or something at my friend's parents' house. And so we make our way around the back of the house and see my friend and his family are all sitting there together. And I said, hey, happy birthday. And my friend replied, what are you doing here? Which is not the response that you want to get when you have just driven an hour to your friend's birthday party. I said, man, I'm here for your birthday. And he said, dude, you're like four hours early. I said, no, 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 no. The Facebook event that I got said that it was this Saturday, 12-2, from 12 till 2. And he said, no, 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 you misread that. The party is 12-2, as in December the 2nd, this Saturday, on December the 2nd. And if you read further down on the invite, what you would have seen is that the party is actually from 4 till 8. You're four hours early for the party. And so I just kind of sheepishly walked over to Meredith and I said, I don't know what we should do at this time. We're four hours early, early for this party, and I like the guy, but I'm not driving all the way home and then all the way back up and then all the way home again. We've only paid for a babysitter for like two or three hours, so I don't know what we're going to do. And so we just asked my friend, do you mind if we just hang out here for a little bit at your party, like four hours early? And he said, no, that's cool. That's totally fine. But it was awkward, you know, because he's there with his family, and they're preparing food, and they're telling old family stories, and, and we could tell that they didn't really want us to be there. We were at the right place... <laughs> but it was the wrong time. And part of being successful in life is not just about being in the right room, it's about being in the right room at the right time. Part of being successful in life is not just about saying the right thing, it's about saying the right thing at the right time. And Jesus was a master of this. Jesus always knew the right thing to say, always knew the right time that he should say it, so much so that he was a master of every time that someone came to him with some kind of sin, he didn't just tell them to not sin, he drew them in lovingly and then said to them, go and sin no more. Jesus knew the times that he was living in. He knew who was at war with whom. He knew which nation was against which nation. He knew when he should stay in a particular community. He knew when he needed to leave that community. And because Jesus traveled around that region so much, he knew what the journey was like in different areas that he traveled to. And so it's with all of this context that Jesus created this perfect illustration in this provocative parable of the Good Samaritan as he shared it with the lawyer on that day. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied this or if you've ever actually been there, but the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho was not an easy journey to make. Firstly, it was about 18 miles. And I don't know the last time that you walked 18 miles in a day, but I certainly haven't ever done it. And so they would journey from Jerusalem to Jericho 18 miles. And it wasn't just 18 miles in a straight direction, like on a highway of paved road. It was 18 miles of winding, treacherous path because Jerusalem is an elevated city about 3,000 feet above sea level and Jericho is down below sea level. And so because of the distance that they're traveling and because of the altitude that's, cha that's changing, there's all kinds of weather systems that change in this distance as well. And because of the distance and because of the altitude that's changing, it's an incredibly treacherous, winding, meandering path. Matter of fact, Dr. Martin Luther King said it this way in describing that path. He, he says, it is a winding, meandering road. In the days of Jesus, it became known as the bloody pass. 
It is possible that the priest and the Levite looked over at that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. There was all kinds of places that the robbers could hide in, or maybe the man on the ground was simply being used to lure them in so that they could be attacked as well. You see, the priest and the Levite were most likely returning home. We read this in the scripture, and I drew emphasis to it specifically because it says that they were heading down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho was the place where the priests and the Levites often lived, and Jerusalem was the place where these people went to work. They lived in Jericho. They worked in Jerusalem. And so if they lived in Jericho and they worked in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the place where the temple was. And Jesus, in telling this story, says that they headed down the path. Some people teach this scripture and they say, maybe one of the reasons that the Levite and the priest didn't help this person is because of an Old Testament scripture and a law that says that the the priests and the Levites cannot touch someone who is dead lest they be defiled and therefore they are unable to go about their temple duties. But that's unlikely because they were headed down. They were going home. They had already fulfilled their temple duties. And even if it were the case, even if these two were so concerned about defiling themselves and being unable to fulfill their temple duties, what it tells us when they walked around the guy that was laying on the side of the road was that their focus was on the fact that they didn't want to defile themselves rather than seeing the glory and the creation of God that was laying on the ground. It makes me ask, what is your perspective on? Now, I know that you've never done this, but I do this semi-regularly and I'm ashamed to say it, but like sometimes, you know, you come across somebody and you say, hey man, how's your day going or how's your week going? And then they give you a real answer, not just that like, hey, all, all is good, God is great, keep on going, like you don't even have to slow down, everything's good in that conversation. But you realize this person is all of a sudden giving you a really truthful, honest, vulnerable answer and you're getting sucked into the reality of it. And you ask the question, so it's your fault in the first place, but then they start telling you like, oh man, this is going wrong and my kids are acting crazy and my finances aren't right and my wife isn't listening to me or my husband just did this or whatever it is. And you realize I just need to slowly back out of this conversation as well as I possibly can. But what's your perspective on? When someone new starts at your workplace and they look a little bit different to you, do you see that person with potential or are you afraid and nervous of what that conversation might bring when you enter into it with them? Do you sit around and complain that this world is going to hell and that the youth of today are destroying it by running wild in the streets or do you display the glory of God by pulling a little bit of his heaven into every situation that you're in because God is looking for a people that would cast off restraint and get emotionally involved into a community that is craving for a touch of God, a touch that only God can provide, but a touch that because of God and His goodness and because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of the Holy Spirit that He has imparted to us, it is a touch that we can also provide as well. A touch where we have the strength, we have the faith, we have the ability, we have the unction, we have the compassion to speak to a world that is going crazy with chaos. What is your perspective on? It's unlikely that the priest and the Levite were concerned about touching the man and being defiled and being unable to fulfill their temple duties. What's far more likely is that these two men were driven by fear and kept asking themselves the question, if I help that man, what is going to happen to me? Now, many of you have met my mom. My mom is a saint. She is a modern day good Samaritan. And I know that you think that your mom is awesome, but your mama has got nothing on my mama. And I love, <laughs> I love my mom. But a few years ago, she told me this story and she said, hey, uh, we were, I was just out for a walk uh, tonight and uh, this situation happened. She said, I was walking along this meandering path as the sun set and everything started to go dark. And then all of a sudden I found myself on a relatively secluded area where there weren't any lights, where there weren't any other people around. And of course it is in that specific spot that I see off in the distance some young people that are clearly up to no good. And so she started thinking to herself, what what can I do? What are my options here? Because I need to keep on going through this area to get home. She thinks, what can I do? 
well, maybe I could run, maybe I could outrun these guys. But if you've seen my mom, she's like four foot eight and she's got tiny legs and she's not gonna outrun anybody. She thought, maybe I can fight them off. Well, my eyesight is not that good, and so I don't know if there's two of them or four of them or 10 of them I don't know up there, but there's a bunch of young people, and I need to avoid them at all costs. And so she just starts taking this really wide route around them to try and put as much distance between the group of young people and herself as possible. And then as she gets closer and closer and closer, she realizes that several of them have turned around and started walking in her direction. And so she braces herself for what is ever, whatever is getting ready to happen next. She clenches her fist, ready to fight if she needs to, and she can feel all of the adrenaline start running. It's that fight or flight mechanism that's starting to kick in. And they get closer and closer and closer, and then one of them puts out their hands and says, excuse me, ma'am, we found this little injured echidna, this tiny little animal, and we don't know what to do. Can you help us? They had found an endangered animal and they didn't know what to do. And so my mom stood there realizing the prejudice that she had brought into this conversation, into this situation. And so she gave them the phone number to call for when you see injured wildlife. And then she hightailed out of there as quickly as she possibly could, got home and told us the story and said, guys, I had to repent. My brothers and I, she said, guys, I have to repent of this situation of what I just did because these young people could have been you. And I would hate the idea that just because you're out trying to take care of a little injured animal that people would assume that you were up to no good. Yeah. Fear in that situation had won the battle. Now in Judaism, Levites and priests are very similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. Levites came out of the tribe of Levi, who was one of the sons of Jacob or Israel. And priests, had temple duties and priests came out of the, the tribe of, of Levi. So all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. And I venture to say that the reality of the story of the Good Samaritan is probably lost on an audience of today here in 2020. And it's after centuries and centuries of good public relations that we can understand the Samaritan was a good guy. But in the original story, in the original context, to the original audience, this wouldn't have been the case. There would have been no such thing as a good Samaritan. It's like an oxymoron. You cannot have a good Samaritan in the same way that you cannot have like a peacekeeping missile. It's not the same thing. It's an oxymoron, right? So much so that the lawyer refused. When asked at the end of the conversation between he and Jesus, he refused to answer the question, who was the neighbor to this man on the side of the road? the lawyer refused to say it was the Samaritan. He said it was the man who had mercy on him. As if even uttering the word, the Samaritan, would have filled him with such vile and hatred and sickness. He said it was the one who had mercy on him. And the reason that there was such hatred, because it wasn't just the Jews that hated the Samaritans, it was also the Samaritans that hated the Jews. This was a feud that had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, ever since the northern tribe of Israel had been carried off into Samaria and into exile. There had been hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans because the northern tribe of Israel started to intermingle with the people in that area, started to get to know them, started to have kids with them. And so now as a result, the Jews saw themselves as the pure people, the pure tribe and the Samaritans, well, they were a mixed breed. We didn't want anything to do with them because they were a mixed breed and we were truly the holy ones. It is with this context that Jesus used the perfect illustration to show the hatred that existed between these two different groups. And it's not even really the story of the Jews and Samaritans. This is a story about all of us. This is a story about you and me. This is a story about you and whoever you have unforgiveness in your heart with. This is a story of anything that you have allowed to stop and to prevent you from being in right relationship with a person or a group and therefore not allowed yourself to see that person as your fellow neighbor. This is not just a story about the Jews and the Samaritans, but it's really a story about people who are far from God. And when you see people who are far from God, you're likely to see that they're probably gonna believe different things. They're probably going to wear different clothes and they're probably going to think different things. But then as a result, it might be easy to criticize those people.
But where in the Bible do you ever see Jesus criticizing the broken for being broken, or the poor for being poor, or the sick for being sick? Nowhere, never. Jesus, our God, is full of compassion, and he has poured that compassion out on us, able to fill every need, able to be a solution and an answer in every situation that we have. And if that's the God that we worship, then these are the followers that we should be too. But far too often, we are just like the Levite and the priest. We like to think of ourselves like the Samaritan in this story. We've been brought up to believe that we are the Samaritan in this story. But far too often, we see the needs in our community and we just choose to walk on by just like the Levites and the priests did. And so when you see the person, the guy that's sitting on the side of the road with the cardboard sign, you know, like we've all seen him, right? And he's sitting there on the side of the road and he says that he needs help and you choose to turn the other way because you think, well, he's got his own issues. He put himself in that situation. He probably made some bad decisions, so it's his fault. Or you look at the woman who has just been diagnosed with lung cancer and you think, well, she's been smoking for her whole life, so she probably deserves it. She knew the consequences and she still chose to do it anyway. And we don't have the compassion and God doesn't allow us to see the person as our neighbor because we have prevented ourselves from doing so. But it is simply by the grace of God that we don't deal with the same issues. It is by the grace of God and only because of his goodness. It is only because of his goodness that I am saved, that I am free, that I am restored. It is only because of his goodness. And how dare I only have enough love for those who treat me right and have judgment for those who might choose to do things a little bit differently. And how dare the world treat those in need better than we treat them within the church when we have the perfect example in the service of Jesus Christ. How dare the world do it in a better way than we can. You see, it is the robbers and the thieves in this story of the Good Samaritan that did the wrong thing, but it is the Levite and the priest that didn't do the right thing. This is the difference in the, sin, in the idea of sins of omission and sins of commission. And so when you see someone who is in need in our community and you choose to do nothing about it, you choose to have no compassion towards the person, you might not necessarily be doing the wrong thing, but you are certainly not doing the right thing either. The Levite and the priest were driven by this idea, this fear of if I don't, if I help this person, something might happen to me. But the Samaritan was driven by this idea of if I don't help this person, what might happen to them? Tick tock. Tick tock, the clock is ticking. Our community is crying out in need. Our community is bleeding on the streets. And we have the solution, we have the answer. But the clock is ticking. Tick tock, what are you gonna do about it? What is your perspective on tick tock? Now here's the deal. Jesus was betrayed in community. Have you ever thought about that? He wasn't betrayed by people that didn't know him. He was betrayed in community. And Jesus' focus wasn't simply on this idea of self-preservation and protection of himself. His focus was on how can I be a generous, living sacrifice to those who are in need. He was betrayed by those that he was in community with, and he had the potential, he had the ability to choose a different 12 people that he could roll with, but Jesus chose the 12 people that he did, knowing ahead of time that one would betray him. And so if Jesus chose to spend his time with those people, then I'm guessing that we don't have the ability to choose a perfect 12 or 10 or 15 group of people that we can spend our time with. Because when you get busy into life with people, you, quit, you pretty quickly realize that people will let you down, that people will not show up, that people will say the wrong things, that people will hurt you, that people will be nasty, that people will simply go too far in certain situations, that people will disappoint you. And then when that happens, it can be really tempting to allow that fear to start settling into your mind where you start thinking, well, I knew that I never should have gotten involved in this community anyway because people have let me down. And so then you just retreat back into your home. You think, well, I invested in myself. I invested in this community. I made myself vulnerable and I got hurt as a result of doing it. So I'm gonna retreat back and just watch Netflix every single night because I know that Netflix can never hurt me. But people are gonna hurt you. 
And Jesus chose to be in community anyway when it cost him his life. You can be friendly with everybody, but you can only be deep with a few. We see this in the reality that Jesus chose his 72, Jesus chose his 12, Jesus chose his three, and ultimately Jesus chose his one. And Jesus didn't act the same way with all of these different groups. Jesus didn't share the exact same thing with all of these different groups. You can be friendly with everybody, but you can only be deep with a few. And if you don't answer the question of who is my 12? Who is my three? Who is my one? How can I serve the people in my community? Then you begin to look at all the needs in your community and you become paralyzed. Like, I can't do everything. I can't answer every situation. I can't be the solution everywhere. And you become paralyzed. And it is potential, potentially true that the Levite and the priest saw the guy that was on the side of the road and they thought, well, I can't be the solution here because I can't be the solution everywhere. And there's someone that's in need right here, but if there's someone in need around the next corner and the next corner and the next corner, I can't get something started that I'm not gonna be able to continue and so they just don't help the first person. And it is true that you cannot be the solution to every situation everywhere. You cannot foster every child in every community. You cannot financially pull everybody out of every homeless shelter. You cannot evangelize to every prison in every community in every city. But I believe that when God puts in your heart the ability to truly be an authentic, honest, organic, vulnerable community that we will see transformation eventually take place where our prisons will empty, where our homeless shelters will shut down because they won't be needed, where our foster system will essentially become unnecessary, where abortion will become unthinkable, and where the poor and disenfranchised will eventually find a home here. I believe that as we enter into this type of community organically, that we will see these things take place. Jesus has been preparing the harvest for some time now. And I wonder what your perspective is on. Is your perspective when you drive through your neighborhood as you're going home or leaving for work, is your perspective on all the potholes that exist in your community? Is your perspective on the sidewalks that haven't been shoveled is your perspective on the people in their homes that need to hear from God? What's your perspective on? Because the harvest is ready. And the harvest is ready right now. Do you see it? Do you see the harvest? Are you aware of it? Are you listening for it? Do you see it, what Jesus has been doing in our community? Because everybody, and I truly mean this, everybody has the ability to be in community with each other. Everybody has the ability to do so. And in order to do so really effectively, there are some things that we can learn from the Samaritan and how he served the guy who was bloodied on the side of the road. Number one, this is what the Samaritan did. He carried his solution with him. We see this where the Samaritan took out some of his oil and some of his wine and poured it on the, on the uh, wounds that the person had. He carried his solution with him. And just in that same way, I believe that you are a solution with skin on. Years ago when I was in college, I remember I was riding my bike one day and I see this woman in her yard trying to start up her lawnmower. And she was pulling the cord and she was pulling the cord and pulling the cord and she just couldn't get her lawnmower to start. And so I thought, God, this is my opportunity to make a difference in the world. This is my opportunity to help this damsel in distress. I'm gonna make a difference. And this woman was probably like 80, 90 years old or something like that, and I thought she probably shouldn't even be mowing her grass in the first place, but God, this is my opportunity to make a difference. And so I pull my bike over and I get off my bike and I walked up to the lady all confident like I'm getting ready to have my blessings in heaven realized because of the goodness of what I'm getting ready to do. I said, excuse me, ma'am, you look like you are in need of help. Can I help you? And she said, that would be so wonderful. I'd love your help. I can't get my lawnmower started. And I said, stand aside. I've got this. No big deal here. And so I got down on my hands and my knees and I grabbed the cord and I ripped the cord the first time and absolutely nothing happened. And I thought, I'll do it again. I'll rip the cord and absolutely nothing happened. And so I went again and again and again and nothing happened. And I start getting frustrated, like having one of those frustrated conversations with God, like, God, come on, this was my opportunity to serve this woman, to make a difference in my community. And you know I don't have a lot of money because I'm in college, but this is my opportunity to make a difference right here. Come on. So I give it another go. And I start praying and laying hands on the lawnmower, like believing that it's gonna make a difference. And this woman's just standing there watching me and I'm feeling all embarrassed and dejected and upset about it and frustrated. 
And I said to the woman, I don't know what to do. Your lawnmower probably flooded by now. I don't know what to do, so I'm sorry, but I can't be of any help. And so with my tail between my legs, I retreat back to my bicycle and I go back home, all frustrated and upset, like, God, you could have started that lawnmower. I could have had a great encounter with this person. Why didn't you allow me to make a difference in the community? And then I realized all of a sudden, you have a lawnmower in your own garage. Why don't you just grab your own lawnmower? And this woman only lives like a mile down the road. So I just took my lawnmower and I wheeled it down the road all the way back to her house. And before she came out to find out what was going on, I started up my lawnmower and I started pushing my lawnmower around her yard. And I probably should have checked the height that the lawnmower was on because very quickly I realized that I wasn't just actually mowing the grass, I was removing the grass and it was just <laughs> a dirt patch on the ground. And so I realize, I look up into our house and realize through the window that she's getting ready to come out and find out what all this noise is about. So I quickly kick all the grass clippings <laughs> back onto the dirt to try and cover up the dirt pile that I've now started. But she comes out and she says, what are you doing back here? And I said, well, ma'am, I just decided to bring my lawnmower back over so that I could mow your grass. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. Let me go back inside and get you some money. And I said, I don't want your money. I'm just happy to be here today. And she said, why would you be so generous? And I said, I serve a God who has been generous to me and the least that I can do is to be generous to you today. And so it is in that opportunity that I got the opportunity to share the gospel with this lady, invited her to church and changed the trajectory of her life. And I believe that whatever you make available to God, He will use and He will bless. Whether it is your lawnmower or whether it is your hair clippers or whether it is your ability to correct grammar or whatever it is, God will use it if you ask and if you make it available to Him. You are a solution with skin on. You have everything that you need to make a difference in the community that God wants you to make. You don't need to be smarter. You don't need to be wiser. You don't need to be wealthier. You don't need to be taller. You don't need to be darker. You don't need to be lighter. You have everything that you need to make a difference and God has made it available to you. All you have to do is open your hand and make it available to Him. Number one, he carried the solution with him. Number two, he inconveniences himself. This man gets off his donkey and then he puts the man on his donkey and he carries him into the inn. He could have just dropped him off at the inn and then gone about his way, but he stayed the night with him. Have you, ever guys, have you guys ever seen that in the scripture that he actually stays his night with him? He stays in community with him. He doesn't just like invite him to church like, hey, we uh, worship together on Sunday mornings at Cornerstone Church. It'd be awesome if you could come with us. That'd be great. Okay, see ya. No, like he stays in community with him. He gets invested in community with him. He gets dirty. He gets messy. He gets involved in his business. He stays the night with him. That's point number two. Point number three, he understood that the answer to the problem was his responsibility. It is his responsibility. Being an answer to a problem is your responsibility. Being in good community is your responsibility. I hear from people from time to time that say, man, I've been at this church for like 10 or 15 years, but no one's ever invited me over to their house for a meal, for lunch or for dinner. And I think that's tragic that you can be at a church for 10 or 15 years and that no one's invited you over to their house. But then I follow up with that person and I say, then you do it then you do it because you are a solution with skin on and responsibility is all of ours when it comes to community. Then you do it. Jesus makes this really clear in the story of the, when he fed the 5,000. We had 5,000 people that are sitting around hungry and the disciples say to Jesus, send them away. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And so yes, he performs the miracle Yes, he breaks the bread and he multiplies it, but it is the disciples that feed the 5,000 on that day. It is the disciples that do it because they understood that it is their responsibility to feed those who Jesus wanted them to feed. It is the attitude and the responsibility of all of the disciples of Jesus to feed those who, of who he wants us to feed, to care for those of who he wants us to care for. It is the responsibility and the attitude of all true disciples to care for those that Jesus brings us into community with. So practically, how do we do this? Because theoretically, these are some really nice things. But practically, how do we do it? I really care about the practicalities. When Jesus said that we should love our neighbors, 
I believe that he wasn't just talking about the person on the far side of the community, on the other side of town or on the other side of the world. He wasn't just talking about the people that the nonprofits in our community care for, the down and out and all of those kind of things. Because when you paint this metaphorical brush on the parable of the Good Samaritan, then we lose the fact that, this, that the neighbor is a very real person. And when you try and care for everybody, you really care for nobody at the same time. And so what if when Jesus said that you should love your neighbor, what if we didn't just take the bumper sticker of love your neighbor and slap it on our car, but what if we literally did something about it? That's where this block map comes from that we've got an image for that I wanna show you right now. Because when you know your neighbors, you're less likely to call code enforcement when their grass grows too long. When you know your neighbors, you're less likely to call the police when their music is too loud too late into the evening. And what used to be a conversation between neighbors has now resulted in a call to the authorities because we've lost the idea of what community means in our neighborhood. And so here's what we want you to do, very practically. There's gonna be a link to this uh, in the podcast if you're listening to this in the show notes, uh, if you can listen to it later on our podcast. This will also be on our website as well. You'll be able to grab this image that you see and you can print it off and you can put it up on your fridge. And this is what we want you to do with it. You are the house that's right in the middle. There are eight homes around your neighborhood. Now your neighborhood might not look exactly like this. You might live in an apartment where you've got people above you and below you and all of those kind of things, right? But what we want you to do is to print this off and to fill in as much information about the nearest eight people that you live close to as possible. Start with their names. Put in their names. This is so-and-so and and this is so-and-so. Next to them lives so-and-so and and -and so-and-so. This here is a single person and, and fill it in, so on and so forth. And then when you've got their names filled in, try and fill in as much other information that you possibly can as well. Like, where do they work? What do they do? How many children do they have? Fill in as much information that you possibly can. And then once you've done that, that's step one. Step two is go out into your neighborhood and start conversations with your people. And now you're wondering like, am I asking you to actually have conversations with people in your neighborhood? You are absolutely right. That's what I'm asking you to do have conversation, and it can be scary, right? Because I'm talking about your neighbors, and these might be people that you once upon a time, like 10 years ago, you introduced yourself and you learned their name, and now you've forgotten their name, and so now every time that you see them, you just wave, God bless you, hey bro, hey, how you doing? And you can't remember their name, and so it's kind of awkward, and you never wanna get too close into community with them. But if you humble yourself and walk over to that person and say, hey, I know that you told me your name like 10 years ago, but I've forgotten it. I apologize, will you tell me again because I wanna be a better neighbor to you. If you know your neighbor's names, you're far less likely to get an issue with the things that they're doing. You can't possibly love the way that we have been called to love if you don't know the neighbor's names that you're living most close to. And it's far too easy to hate people if you don't know them. So we're asking for you to get into better organic community with those who are in your neighborhood. And really, it's this idea of moving people from strangers to acquaintances to those who you are in relationship with. And it can be inconvenient and it can be awkward and uncomfortable when you're right here in the middle, but we're asking you to move from those who are strangers to those who are acquaintances, moving them into those who you are in relationship with. And you might already know all of your neighbors and all of your neighbors might ultimately be saved already, which is wonderful and I'm glad that you're in that community. Chances are that is not true for the vast majority of us. And even if it is true for you, you can still be a better neighbor. You can still be in better community with those who are, you're in, in your neighborhood with. And so there are ways that you can do this and I would encourage you, I would implore you to think about this. Keep your motive pure. It's really important to do this. Keep your motive pure because we want to love our neighbors not just to convert them. We love our neighbors because we have been converted. We don't love people just to evangelize to them. Keep your motive pure. And so I would encourage you, don't think of this vast scheme of like you pretend like you were just baking a cake and you ran out of an egg and now you need to go over to your neighbor's house and I'm really sorry, I need an egg, can you help me out? And then now you've got a foot in the door and by the way, do you know about Jesus? Do you wanna come to church with me on Sunday? Because your neighbor will see through that immediately, right? That's not honest, that's called having having an ulterior motive. What we want you to focus on is the ultimate motive. 
The ultimate motive that we wanna be in community is so that people can be in right relationship with God as well. And if you keep your focus on the ultimate motive, then you won't get sidetracked with the ulterior motive. Keep your motives pure. And ultimately, we share about the things that we love. Whether you love a sports team or you love a certain type of food and so you take photos of it and for whatever reason we decide to post photos of all the food that we think is fantastic. We share about the things that we love. We just naturally do that. And so if you're not telling your community about your relationship with God, it tells me one of two things. Either you don't love God the way that you say that you do or you don't love your community the way that you say that you do. Because we ultimately share freely about the things that we love and it should be natural to us. So how do we do this as a church? Number one, I would encourage you to slow down. We have so many time-saving devices these days. We have all kinds of things, whether it comes to email on your phone or the ability to call in for meetings and conference in and all of these things that never used to exist, but we have all of these time-saving devices that now have not really saved us any time. All they do is just create some space for us to enter more things into our already busy schedule. And so yes, I am asking you to create more space in your week to be able to be in better community. And I know that it's already difficult to keep up with the friends that you do have already, But as we create more space and as we slow down, I believe that we will see community organically take place. John Ortberg says it like this. He says, love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time and time is the one thing that hurried people do not have. If you are too busy or too hurried to be in community with God and with people, you are literally missing the point of life. Jesus, when we look at his life on earth, got a whole lot of things done. And he often allowed himself to be inconvenienced and to be interrupted. But you never really see Jesus in a hurry, do you? Jesus allowed himself to be interrupted all the time, but he wasn't hurried. Slow down. Stop rushing through life. What else can we do? We can eat together. Meredith talked about this last week, that eating is this idea that brings us all into this neutral plane together. Because the idea of eating says that we are all the same, that we all have something on the outside of us that we need to bring onto the inside of us. So if we all have to do it anyway, we might as well do it together. And so during our fast that we had at the beginning of this year, I didn't really socialize too much with people, partially because I'm not enjoying the foods that I'm eating, and so it makes me not want to go out and socialize and be in community together. But now that we're not fasting, in the last week, I've hung out with like eight or nine different people, and Meredith tells me that my extrovert is showing and that I need to slow down and I'm getting too excited. But seriously, being in community does not need to be expensive, but you do have to be intentional. Eating together is a great way to be in community together. Next, VOW, our volunteer outreach week. This is something that we have as our church every July, every summer that we get involved in our community because we have life groups that allow us to be in deeper community with people, but then also we have VOW. We know that as a church, really our ultimate purpose is to remove the barriers that exist between people and their ability to encounter and experience God. And so if someone has an unmet need, we know that we need to step into that need as a church and work on removing that need so that they can encounter and experience the God that we serve. And so that's how we do that. As a church, we step in and make these short-term commitments in addition to the long-term commitments that we're encouraging you make by getting to know the neighbors that are immediately around you. If you're not yet involved in a life group, we would encourage you to get involved in one as soon as possible. We know that there are some people who are already on a waiting list because more people are joining so quickly that we don't have the ability to create groups fast enough. And if you've been at this church for a while and if you think that being a life group leader might be something that God would want of you, we encourage you to get involved in that because we have people that are desperate to be in community and we cannot create groups fast enough at all of our different locations. So VOW is our short-term commitment into our community that's coming up and we've already got plans going and we're excited about it this July. The story of the Good Samaritan is immediately followed in the book of Luke by the story of Mary and Martha. 
And the story of Mary and Martha is a beautiful illustration of how we can be focused on the time and the season that we are in and how we can be responsive to what God is doing in a situation. It reads like this in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. It reminds me of the old Brady Bunch, like, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. But when you contrast these two stories, the story of the Good Samaritan, we see that it is the service, the action, the activity of the Samaritan that is praised and recognized and honored. But in the very next story, the story of Mary and Martha, it is the service and it is the action and the activity of Martha that is criticized. So which is it? Is it that we should be serving or is it that we should be sitting? What does God want of us? Tick tock, tick tock, because the clock is ticking and it's all about making sure that we know what God is requiring of us in the season and the situation that we find ourselves in. What's really interesting is that we know these sisters more commonly as Mary and Martha than we do hear about them as Martha and Mary. Mary and Martha, which doesn't really make sense when you consider the fact that Martha is the eldest. Martha is older. She's the one that owned the home in the first place. And if you know anything about the times that the Bible was written in, we know that Uh, that genealogy and order of families and the order that you were born in and birthrights, all of these things were really, really significant. So why do we know them as Mary and Martha more than we know them as Martha and Mary? Could it be that the one who sat in community with with Jesus is being highlighted and promoted? Could it be that this is what Jesus was looking for in that situation? Could it be that even though you are slaving away, trying to make a great name for yourself, trying to provide for the family that you are in relationship with, could it be that what God wants more of you is for you to be in relationship, deeper relationship than trying to build the great name for yourself and trying to provide for the family anyway? Because ultimately people will remember not necessarily the things that you do for them, people will remember the way that you made them feel. People are less likely to remember the things that I've said in this message and more likely to remember the way that you felt as a result of hearing this message in a few days' time. See, Martha was a detail-oriented person. She focused on the detail. She focused on the activity. She focused on everything that needed to be exactly, precisely right. But she took Jesus' instructions. She took his criticism to heart. She didn't get bitter about it. She gets better And we see that the next time that we encounter Martha in the Bible was when her brother, Lazarus, she believes has just died. And now she could have stayed in the home, she could have retreated, she could have been working, she could have been weeping and wailing, but when Jesus arrives at her home again, she rushes out to greet him. She gets emotionally involved in conversation with him. She has learned the lesson that it is far better to be in community with Jesus than it is just to be focused on the serving in the first place. Both are important. Both have different requirements. Both have a time that each is appropriate. And Martha has learned that lesson. There is a guy in the Old Testament. He's another one of the sons of Israel. His name is Issachar. Issachar was one of the sons of Jacob. And his sons are funnily enough known as the sons of Issachar. They are a famous group of people that are known for knowing the season and the times that they are in. They pay attention to what God is doing in a community. They pay attention to not only what God is doing and God is saying, but also what they should be doing in response. The sons of Issachar have an anointing of knowing the season and the time that they are in. And this is a genderless anointing. This is something that you can have today. This is something, matter of fact, that I would love to pray over you today. 
This is the idea that you know the will of God for your life, that you know what God would have you do in every different situation, that you, you would know what God would have you say, that God would tell you how to act, that God would tell you what you should be doing in every different situation. This is the anointing of the sons of Issachar. And it's genderless because we see that in the sons of Issachar, they anointed Deborah to be a judge long before women in leadership were even recognized. This is really about being a child of Issachar. And so if you want this in your life today, if you want to know the will of God for your life, if you want to know how you should be responding, I would just ask that you stand up here in this place. If you sometimes wonder, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? Would God have me move in this situation? Would you stand to your feet right now? I believe that this is for everybody. I believe that everybody should be standing in this room right now. If you want to know the will of God for your life, stand in this place. Because I wanna pray this anointing over you before we get ready to dismiss here in just a few moments. The anointing of the sons of Issachar over your life that you would know what you should be doing in season and out of season. Our community is dying on our streets. Our community is craving for a touch of God, a touch that we can provide. And we need to know when to act, when to step into the room, when to say the right thing, not just saying the right thing, but when we should be acting. So let's pray. God, if you gave it to them, there's no reason that you can't pass that same anointing onto us. We are desperate to see you move. We are desperate to see you move through us. We ask for the knowledge of when to act and when to hold our tongue. We ask for the knowledge of when to serve and when to sit. We ask that You would make Your will and Your way clear in our lives. We ask for strategy. We ask for humility. We ask for discernment. We ask for wisdom. We ask for community, God. We ask for salvations, God. We ask for restoration in our communities, God. We ask to see Your promises realized. We're asking for it today, God. We're asking for Your glory to be made manifest, God. We're asking to see You move in our communities, God. We're asking that You would move through us, God. We're asking, God. We're asking, God. We're asking, God. This is our prayer today, God. We're asking for it, God. Won't You move, God? Won't You move through us, God? We're asking. We ask for it today, God. We know that You'll do it because You're a good God and we're asking for it, God. We ask today, God. We're asking for it, God. I hope that message meant something to you and that it means something in your days to come. Yeah, if this message has blessed you and you wanna sow into the ministry of Cornerstone Church, you can do so from wherever you are today. Simply jump on our website at cornerstone.church and you can find the link there so that you can give in whatever way is most convenient to you. And we'll see you back here next time.